I just love you all, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you're here on Mother's Day, and um, I would love for you to direct your attention up to the screens because I want to show you a video of a poem uh, written by Billy Collins that some of you have heard before. I've, I've shown this at Grace one time before, so some of you will be familiar with this poem. It's definitely worth seeing a second time if you've seen it before, but look up at the screens because this will, this will set me up perfectly for where I'm going to try and take us today in this Mother's Day message. This one. The other day, as I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. <laughs> she nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim, and I in turn presented her with a lanyard. <laughs> here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education, and here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones, and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. So, Mother's Day can be a little bit sensitive. You know, not everyone's mom is still living today. Um, not everyone here has an amazing relationship with their mom. Uh, not every woman here has children, and sometimes that's by choice, sometimes that's by life, and sometimes it's simply not yet. Uh, some moms here today have lost a child. Some moms have children that they're estranged from or that they're worried about, and there's lots of other dynamics that can make a relationship with a mom a little bit tricky. But, but none of those... Uh, those challenges are worth us backing off of spending a few minutes honoring moms. And I'm going to try and do that today, but I'm going to need you to trust me. And I'm going to need you to, to walk with me through a few thoughts here because I want to do this in kind of a roundabout way. I want to start today by reading a few of the childbirth scriptures in the Bible. And none of these verses would make it into the top 10 list of most popular Mother's Day verses. So just run with me for a second. The first one I want to read comes from Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And this is actually the first time childbirth is mentioned in the Bible. And it's mentioned in the context of the fall, when rebellion and sin had damaged the creation. And God is speaking into the aftermath of that. And he says this in verse 6, To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. And that's not a very cheerful Mother's Day verse, but um, I, I have heard that that's true. It, it is, I have heard that, that childbirth can be a bit uncomfortable. Is that a thing? 
<laughs> is that a real thing? Um, here, here's another one. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 21, it says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. That, that, that's a great verse, except what we don't know from this verse because we don't discover it unless we analyze some of the surrounding verses, is that 20 years separate the, the first and second sentence of that verse. Isaac prayed for his wife, Rebekah, to conceive for 20 years before she conceived. And so when she conceived, it would have been a celebration. It would have been a party. They would have been telling everyone. They would be hosting gender reveals. Um, but, but then it says in the very next verse, the babies, because she was pregnant with twins, jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? Other translations say that they struggled together in her womb. And I don't know, but I think that fist fighting twins in your womb does not sound fun. It seems like a little MMA match inside your womb would create a little morning sickness. By the way, doesn't the term morning sickness just sound kind of light and fluffy? <laughs> oh, you're having a little morning sickness today? <laughs> yes, I want to throw up in your face. Uh, Jessica had severe morning sickness with all three of the pregnancies. I actually made a mistake once. Um, my favorite food is Mongolian barbecue. And I took her to Moon's Mongolian Barbecue when she was horribly sick. My favorite fruit ever. We haven't been back in 26 years. <laughs> but um, Re Rebecca's fist-fighting twins were Esau and Jacob. Esau grows up and marries two wives, which was never a positive move, even way back in the Old, and Old Testament days. And Esau's two wives made his mother Rebecca's life miserable. At the end of chapter 26, Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. It's pretty intense. So uh, Jacob, fortunately, doesn't follow in Esau's footsteps. He marries Rachel. And that was a good choice, except when Rachel was ready to give birth to their second son, the Bible says that her labor was hard labor. And it was such severe childbirth labor that she wanted to name the son Benoni, which means the son of my sorrow. Fortunately, Jacob was standing right there and he's like, hold on a second, time out. We cannot let this boy grow up being called pain and sorrow everywhere he goes. So he says, let's name him Benjamin, which means the son of my strength or the son of my right hand. But unfortunately, the, the childbirth was so traumatic and so painful that it actually took Rachel's life. So it was a moment of deep sorrow and pain. And there are other scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about the pain as well as the blessing, of course, of childbirth. But when we get to the New Testament, we find in the Bible one of the strangest childbirth passages ever. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul is writing, and, and he's the one that says these words. In fact, we, we read these recently when we were having a big conversation here at Grace about women in ministry. The Apostle Paul says this, 1 Timothy 2.14, <clears throat> Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Are, are these great Mother's Day verses, by the way? <laughs> but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, there's a lot of speculation about what this verse might mean. Nobody has a, a, an a universally agreed upon interpretation of this passage. It's one of the most confusing passages in the Bible. Most theologians are agreed that Paul could not be talking about the salvation that we experience through Jesus Christ because that's not how a person gets salvation. And even if he was saying that, what would that mean for all of the women that haven't had children? Does that mean they can't be saved? So probably the safest interpretation of this verse is to conclude that Paul was bringing Jesus into the conversation and that Paul was saying if Eve opened the door to sin, and by the way, she wasn't alone in doing that. 
Adam, who was not deceived and who knew exactly what was going on, was right there with her in doing that. But if Eve opened the door to sin, then Mary, the mother of Jesus, through childbearing, brought salvation back into the world. But, but regardless of how we end up interpreting that passage, what I want to point out is there's a reason that that verse is in the Bible. And there's a reason that the Apostle Paul connected salvation with childbearing. So can you all pause that thought for a second and just kind of park it to the side? Don't delete it. I'm not rambling. But I, I want to just come back to that thought in just a second. Have you noticed how popular branding has become in our world today? You know, it used to be that a, a, a product's name was simply its name, but we've, we've gone from naming something to branding things. In fact, we, we even used to say, or we still say, a name brand. But a, a, a brand name today is more than a name. It's a name that encapsulates the essence of the company. So Nike is not just the name of athletic wear. Nike is, is uh, an ethos. And what's the ethos of Nike? Just do it. Nike is actually a Greek word. It means overcomer. When Paul talks about in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer, um, it's, it's the root word Nike. So, so, so it, it's the essence of a thing. So company strategists today ask, are you a maverick, a magician, or a muse? We were watching the, the We Crashed series recently, and they were talking about Carl Jung's branding archetypes, you know, hero, lover, sage, every man, magician, because the, the, these branding strategists say to companies and to business owners, you've got to find the symbol. You've got to find the image or the brand that embodies who you're trying to be. Your brand is what sets you apart. In fact, if you have the right symbol, everyone will know about you even before they get to you. In fact, in recent years, we've even started talking about a personal brand. So it's not just companies that come up with a brand, but, but celebrities or high-profile people talk about what is your personal brand? What is setting you apart? It's really important to understand a brand. So have you ever considered Christianity's brand? How did Jesus and the early followers brand the Christian faith? They, they didn't use that language, but um, did, you, did you ever see this symbol, this little Christian fish? It's kind of a cool symbol. Um, if you're looking for an attorney or a contractor and you see a little fish at the bottom of their advertisement, it's supposed to tell you something. It's supposed to mean something. It's supposed to mean we're Christians. And if you do business with us, you can trust us because we care about you. And, and we're actually going to do some really good work because we're not just working for your money. We're working as an act of worship before a living God. So hopefully the little Christian fish means something. It's pretty recognizable. It's not our original brand. It's kind of fun to talk about the fish because in, in, in early persecuted eras of church history, uh, before the fish became associated with Christianity, it was kind of a secret symbol. If you showed up to a house and there was a little fish carved in the corner of the doorpost, you knew that Christians met there. If you encountered someone and you were trying to get a read and I can't tell, are they friend or foe, you might just casually trace half of a fish. And if they reached out and completed it, you would know, okay, I, I can trust this person. So it's, it's kind of a cool... Um, story, but the fish is not our top branding symbol. Our, our top branding symbol, and I, I heard you saying it, is, is the cross. Um, I, I think that, actually, it, it has to be the most universally recognized symbol anywhere in the world. Um, in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, the Apostle Paul said, I determined to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The, the most important things for the Apostle Paul were Christ and Christ crucified. This is the foundation, the starting point, the pathway, and the finish line of our faith. It's also the answer to the question, by the way, 
is the Christian God good? Is the Christian life worth living? Is the Christian God good? Well, the cross answers that and says, if God is like Jesus, God is good. If the Christian God is Christ-like, he's worth entrusting your life to. And Paul seemed to believe that the image of Christ giving his life away for the world that he loves, whether they love him back or not, is the highest picture of God that we get to see. The cross is the most counterintuitive, mysterious, breathtaking symbol of the Christian faith. Now, if if we're branding our faith, we have a couple of other symbols, not quite as recognizable, but probably number two and three. The next one would be water baptism. Um, The symbol of baptism isn't quite as well known as the cross, but baptism is a universally practiced part of our faith. When someone commits to following Jesus, it's one of their their major steps in going public with this relationship with God. Um, The the other one that's probably right on par with that is communion, sometimes called Eucharist, the communion elements, the bread and the cup. I think those three, cross, baptism, and communion, um, are the top symbols that brand our Christian faith. And so, so hone in here with me on this. What do those three symbols all have in common? Cross, baptism, communion. They all have in common the idea of life coming out of death. If Jesus hadn't been raised on Easter Sunday, we would never wear a cross around our neck. It would be horrifying and it would be stupid to wear an ancient Roman execution symbol around your neck. We're not wearing an execution symbol around our neck. We're wearing the symbol of something that defeated death. We're wearing an image of life that comes from death. Baptism was viewed as a water grave that leads to life. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, "...having been buried with him in baptism..." You were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And then the communion elements, the bread and the cup, were symbols that Jesus compared to his body and his blood. And Jesus told his followers who told those who told us that those symbols of death were actually the portals into a whole new covenant or a whole new realm of life. So, if Christianity has a brand, it would have to embody hope out of sorrow, promise out of loss, life out of death. Are you still with me? Okay, let's go back to our parked thought for a second. Women will be saved... Through childbearing. Hmm. (laughs) That sounds to me an awful lot like our brand. Every person here was brought into this world through pain. Now, I, I know there are random stories of childbirth that occurs where there's not a whole lot of pain, but that's the exception, not the rule. Usually childbirth is when a woman gets to show off all of the cuss words that she knows. <laughs> we do have epidurals to help them with their language, but um, even with an epidural, or Jessica had three C-sections, it, it hurts that there's pain. Every person here was brought into this world through pain. Now, I know that's terribly obvious, but the universality of that makes it mean something. It means something that every human alive today came into this world through pain. And then, after you were birthed through pain, somebody, um, whether you had a single mom, or a mom in a nuclear family, or a stepmom, or a grandma, or, or a dad who stepped in, somebody took care of you. And it wasn't always fun and easy. Um, we, we are crazy about Malachi, our grandson. In fact, can I show you a quick picture? Last week I told you, isn't that what we grandparents do? I told you last week that I would show you the picture of Malachi with his little gold chain. So this was at his one-year birthday. He's just so adorable. And and Amber, my daughter, is just blowing us away as a mom. She's incredible. And, And just since I paused on this little 
family tangent. Can I show you a quick video of Jessica holding Malachi? This is just a little magic moment. So welcome to my living room here for this one. So it's pretty sweet, but, but it's exhausting to raise children. <laughs> and it doesn't always feel like the magical moments outweigh the stressful moments and the exhausting moments of a small child or the stress-ridden and anxious moments of raising a grown child. Childbearing comes with a price. A mother gives her life to bring forth life. And that sounds exactly like our brand, doesn't it? So I wonder if that helps to interpret Paul. I wonder if he was highlighting the fact that part of a mother's calling was to be a living embodiment of the message of salvation. Eve means life giver. And it's fascinating that she was not given that name until after the fall when death and destruction came into the world and the world would be desperately looking for life. Um, I don't know exactly what Paul meant in that verse, but I do know, and and this is the message, every mom who ever lived, your, your mom, imaged salvation for us when they brought us into the world through pain. So so what's the message? What's the takeaway this morning? It's simply this, ladies, just being you, just sitting there breathing, just being who you are in your essence and your nature, your existence is a picture of the Christian message. You, as a living female human, are Christianity's brand. Cross? Baptism, communion, childbearing. They're all symbols of life that comes from pain, of hope that comes from uh, terrible, difficult times. They all image salvation. So ladies, whether you have natural children or not, you are the signature on creation's canvas. But what's the last thing that an artist does when they finish composing their work of art? They sign. they sign it. And it's the signature that makes it authentic. It's the signature that gives it its value. Um, Eve was the final act of creation. She was the signature of the creator. And ladies, the world has called you a lot of different things. But this is your deeper truth. You are the magnum opus of creation. You are the essence and the pinnacle of God. God can't be understood without you. Now, it's true of men, too. It takes both of us together to image God for the world. But there's something fierce and beautiful from the heart of God that can only get displayed through a life giver like Eve. My hope for the message today was simply to settle something deep in your soul of your value, your worth, just by showing up and inhaling and exhaling, you are imaging the hope of the world. You're a miniature picture of the gospel message. And ladies, I would love to pray for you today. Let me have the worship team rejoin me. In fact, all of us males are going to pray for you. Um, the, The Bible's understanding of power is so different than our world's understanding. In our world today, whoever's on top has all the perks. Whoever has the power has the perks, has the position, has the the reserved parking space. Jesus reversed all of that. In the kingdom of God, the one who was given all power took the sacrifice so that everyone else could have the blessing. And that sounds like what a good mom does every day of her life, usually outside the spotlight, usually in secret, usually not knowing if it's making any difference or what will the reward be from this, you are imaging Jesus. 
and God's heart and hope for the world. The vocation of motherhood, often painful, often hidden, is showcasing the brilliance and the beauty and the heart of God for the world. So why don't you stand with me for a moment?